I know she's got those, so <laughs> maybe that one. Yeah. But like, you can only get so many. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, quarter. Quarter. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Good afternoon, everybody. From February 20th to the 22nd, President Biden will travel to Poland. He will meet with President Duda of Poland to discuss our bilateral cooperation, as well as our collective efforts to support Ukraine and bolster NATO's deterrence. He will also meet with the leaders of the Bucharest Nine, a group of our eastern flank NATO allies, to reaffirm the United States' unwavering support for the security of the alliance. In addition, President Biden will deliver remarks ahead of the one-year anniversary of Russia's brutal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, addressing how the United States has rallied the world to support the people of Ukraine as they defend their freedom and democracy, and how we will continue to stand with the people of Ukraine for as long as it takes. With that, my colleague John Kirby from uh, the NSC is going to come up and share some words and take some questions. Good afternoon, everybody. Just a couple things here at the top. Um, I think you know President Lula from Brazil is here today. We'll be meeting with the president soon. He's looking forward to that discussion. Brazil is a key partner of the United States uh, in a region uh, that is also a, a critically important region uh, and an ally as we work together to address common challenges uh, throughout the world, quite frankly not just in this part of it. The president has personal experience working with President Lula from his time as vice president, and they met several times and have, have had multiple calls. Uh, and we, uh, of course, as you know, we've already held a number of high-level engagements since President Lula's election. 
President Biden called President Lula shortly after he was elected to congratulate him and begin identifying areas where the two countries could work together. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan traveled to Brazil for meetings with then-President-elect Lula and members of his incoming administration. And Secretary of the Interior Deb Haaland led, led a presidential delegation to Brazil for the inauguration. And of course, following the January 8 attack on Brazil's democracy, President Biden was quick to call President Lula to convey the United States' unwavering support for democracy in Brazil. The two have had, or they will have, a packed agenda here today discussing issues that are important to both of them, and as I said, to the region and to the world. Uh, that includes combating climate change, stimulating economic development, strengthening democracy, promoting human rights and inclusion, as well as managing irregular migration. Now, this meeting between the two leaders will strengthen the relationship between the United States and Brazil and will help set the stage for upcoming high-level engagements between our two countries. One more uh, note uh, before we jump into questions, and this is uh, just an update on uh, U.S. efforts to respond and to help uh, provide assistance to uh, the people of Turkey and Syria in the wake of those devastating earthquakes. We are ramping up our assistance uh, to, uh, to these earthquakes that have now killed more than 20,000 people in Turkey and Syria, including, that we know of, at least eight American citizens. Now, this is a terrible tragedy, obviously, and our hearts continue to go out to all those impacted. We remain in close contact with our Turkish allies at every level of government, including, of course, a phone call between President Biden and President Erdogan. Yesterday, we announced that the United States will provide $85 million in life-saving assistance to provide shelter to the displaced, as well as food, medicine, and other desperately needed aid. In Turkey, a USAID disaster assistance and response team is already on the ground, and two of our most highly trained urban search and rescue teams are conducting operations uh, in support of Turkish rescue efforts in Adiyaman, one of the hardest hits, hardest hit areas inside the country. Now, these teams have nearly 200 personnel combined between them, specialized equipment and, and canine uh, support dogs as well. They have been able to expand their operational reach with the support of U.S. military Black Hawk helicopters. And because of the extensive damage to roads and to bridges, ground transportation, I think you can understand, is is pretty challenging. Uh, they'll continue to run airlift operations from Inserlik, transporting rescue personnel to sites that they are most needed to conduct operations. The DART teams, as we call them, are also conducting structural damage assessments of many buildings and infrastructure. To date, they have been able to cover more than 630 sites across Adi Yaman. In Syria, our humanitarian partners continue to urgently scale up response efforts to reach people in need. Th that work will include, or has included, chartered flights that are transporting essential medical supplies and teams distributing hot meals and other food. As of this morning, the United Nations and, United Nations and its partners successfully completed its second cross-border humanitarian convoy into northwest Syria, and one of our humanitarian partners delivered 14 additional truckloads of supplies through the Bab al-Hawa crossing, totaling now 20 trucks of critical medicines, food, and water to people in need over the last two days. To underscore that U.S. sanctions will not prevent or inhibit prohibiting humanitarian assistance in Syria, yesterday the Department of Treasury, I think you saw, issued a broad general license to provide additional authorizations for disaster relief assistance to the Syrian people. We already were able to deliver humanitarian assistance without this general license, but we wanted to underscore the importance of humanitarian aid getting in, and so the Treasury went ahead and issued this license as well. This license will be in effect for six months. U.S. humanitarian assistance is delivered directly to the Syrian people, no matter where they live. We are determined to do all that we can to help those affected by these earthquakes in the days, weeks, and months ahead, as required. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So, Poland. Uh, why the president decided to go to Poland? What message he wants to deliver? And is there any chance that he would visit Ukraine? during his visit to, to Poland. And I have also one on President Lula's visit. Uh, President Lula has said he wanted to create a group of countries, including China and India, to mediate peace between Ukraine and Russia. Does the president support this effort? Is this the right time for opening negotiations? Yeah, well, there's a lot there. Uh, um, 
so look on the on the on the trip. I don't have any other additional stops to speak to. Uh, Karine announced the purpose of the trip, and that's to go to Poland. And uh, um, and uh, in Karine's uh, opening statement, I think she answered your main question, which is, what does he want to talk about? He wants to talk about uh, the importance of the international community's resolve and unity in supporting Ukraine for now going on a year. Wouldn't it be great if the president didn't have to make a trip around a one-year anniversary of a war that never should have started? Sadly, that's where we are, and he wants to make sure that he's sending that strong message, not only of the United States resolve, but the international community resolve, um, and to make clear to the Ukrainian people, m most particularly, that the United States is going to continue to stand by them going forward. We know the next weeks and months are going to be difficult and critical, especially for their armed forces, and the United States is going to continue to stand by them. Um, on your question about uh, President Duda and his, uh, his, his peace overtures or, or ideas, is, is that what? President Lula. Uh, oh, Lula, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, he, he said that he wants to create a group of uh, countries to negotiate peace in Ukraine. And those groups, uh, according to him, would include China, India, maybe some other countries. Well, I certainly would re refer to President Lula to speak to, to his ideas. I think uh, in, in, the, in the aggregate, we all would like to see this war end today. Uh, we'd like to see it end. Uh, right now, in other words, without having to go to the negotiating table. That doesn't appear to be in the offing, as Mr. Putin just over the last 24 hours flew dozens more cruise missiles into civilian targets uh, into Ukraine, knocking out um, uh, heat and power across the country. So absent that, we're going to have to stay at the task of supporting Ukraine so that they can succeed at the battlefield. Uh, so that if and when President Zelensky has determined it's time to negotiate and sit down at the table to solve this diplomatically. He can do it with the wind at his back. He can do it with the strength that he that he knows he's going to need in, in that negotiation. So it's really up to President Zelensky to determine if and when negotiations are appropriate and certainly under what circumstances. As President Biden has said countless times, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. Um, can we expect the president to make any kind of formal announcement um, as it pertains to maybe additional security aid? Or will it mostly be sort of a symbolic show of support, as you were talking about, to the Ukrainian people, um, the U.S.-Polish alliance? I won't uh, get ahead of the president's uh, remarks. Certainly, I'm not going to do that. Um, again, the president will make it very clear that the United States will continue to stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. He will continue to call for the kind of international unity that we've seen, not just across NATO, but across the world, uh, or not just across Europe. Um, uh, and I think um, he will certainly make clear that additional security assistance, additional financial assistance, additional help for Ukraine will be coming from the United States. But I, I won't get ahead of anything specific. And I had a quick follow-up on the Chinese spy balloon. Um, this idea that President Xi Jinping may not have been aware of the order to send this balloon over U.S. soil. Um, what would that tell you if that were true about his grip on his own government? Is it, you know, is it possible that it suggests a, a kind of power breakdown? Is it surprising to the U.S.? We certainly can't confirm uh, these reports uh, about uh, President Xi's personal knowledge of that. And I would refer you to uh, the PRC to, to speak uh, to their own uh, uh, leadership issues and, uh, and information sharing. Um, what matters to us is that this was a violation of our sovereign airspace, um, and clearly with intent. Um, now, whose intent? I don't think we have a perfect picture of that right now. Clearly, without question, the, the intent of the PRC, uh, because we know that this balloon belonged to them. Um, and President Biden acted de decisively in support of our national sovereignty. What our reporting is that U.S. officials briefing lawmakers this week told lawmakers that this is the U.S. Uh, intelligence community's assessment. I'm not going to speak to right? intelligence assessments from the podium. So we got to keep going. Good job. Uh, thank you, Green. Uh, Admiral, um, there's been warnings from the Ukrainians as well as <coughs> intelligence agencies in both Europe and, and here that as the one-year mark of the war approaches, that, that might be a moment where Putin tries to really escalate the conflict, maybe even launch some sort of major new offensive. Are you seeing any signs of that being in the works? What we see, Jonathan, is that uh, the Russians continue to conduct 
offensive operations in the Donbass area. The fighting around Bakhmut remains pretty vicious, even as you and I are talking. Clearly, as we've seen over the last 12 hours, he's willing to continue to barrage the country with cruise missiles, knocking out uh, civilian infrastructure and trying to make life more difficult for the Ukrainian people. Uh, and we do believe that he will try to take advantage of these winter months uh, uh, to restock, resupply, rearm, uh, uh, contribute to his manpower. Um, uh, in um, in what could be offensive, uh, renewed offensive operations come spring. But have we seen all that take shape now? I don't believe we're at a point where we've seen all of that really uh, uh, form. But we are anticipating that. And frankly, so are the Ukrainians. Um, and that's one of the reasons why you've seen in just recent weeks the kinds of security assistance packages that, uh, from the United States and, and from others that are more advanced capabilities, the kinds of capabilities that will allow them to fight in open terrain, uh, combined arms capabilities, armored capabilities, artillery, uh, all of that is designed to help them uh, prepare for whatever the Russians might be planning in the spring. All that's to say, we do expect that, again, as the weather improves, the fighting will probably get more vicious. Thank you, Karim. Uh, hi, John. Um, I have more follow-ups on the Lula visit as well as the assistance U.S. providing to Turkey. But really briefly, can you speak to rumors that there is another Chinese balloon above Alaska or any other parts of U.S. territory that the U.S. shot down? So I can confirm that the Department of Defense was tracking a high-altitude object over Alaska airspace in the last 24 hours. Out, uh, the, uh, the object was flying at an altitude of uh, 40,000 feet and posed a reasonable threat to the safety of civilian flight. Out of an abundance of caution and at the recommendation of the Pentagon, President Biden ordered the military to down the object. And they did. And it came in inside our territorial waters. Now, those waters right now are frozen, but inside uh, territorial uh, airspace and over territorial waters. Fighter aircraft assigned to U.S. Northern Command took down the object within the last hour. Okay. Follow up, uh, John, and thank you for that. That's really helpful. Can you uh, give more details on the support that U.S. is providing to Turkey? Specifically, we understand that the USS George H.W. Bush is on standby. Uh, can you update us on whether there's been any communications with Ankara on whether the ship will be any part of humanitarian efforts? I, I think I updated as much as I could right now. That what we're doing is what I put in my opening statement. You're right that there are naval assets that are in the Mediterranean and uh, under the command of uh, U.S. Naval Forces Europe. The commander of U.S. European Command has designated the commander of U.S. Naval Forces Europe as in charge of uh, the operational coordination for military assets, um, and, there, and he is doing that. Um, uh, I, I cannot uh, speak to any specific contributions by the aircraft carrier USS George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush, uh, but obviously there's lots of there's lots of capabilities in the Mediterranean region that could be brought to bear, but. Uh, we're working, and this is a really important point, uh, we're working in lockstep with our Turkish counterparts here to make sure that what we're providing is what they need at the scale and the speed that they need um, and not, you know, not trying to overwhelm uh, their system with, with unneeded material or unneeded capability. So there's, you know, you talked about the Bush, but there's a lot of military capability on the continent uh, under uh, the European commander's um, authority that could be used, but again, uh, we want to make sure that we're doing this uh, in a, uh, appropriately through Turkish counterparts. Really briefly on the visit by President Lula, can you speak about how? I know. She's still asking questions. I hear you. I hear you. Just, just the last question. Just the last question. Can you speak on how Brazil can be a partner in monitoring irregular, irregular uh, migration, specifically because Brazil has been a route for Africans coming to the U.S. Um, through Mexico? I, I, as I said, I, I would expect President Lula and President Biden and to talk about the challenges of irregular migration. You saw the vice president just uh, just this week uh, uh, holding a conference of, uh, uh, of some of our neighbors uh, about uh, this call to action to try to get at the root causes. And certainly we look and, and, and would welcome uh, President Lula's ideas and perspectives on how we can get at the root causes of, uh, of all the migration in, in this hemisphere. Okay. Thank you. Um, when I hear news, I just get very excited. I, yeah, yeah. So, um, Fancy that. Yes. Um, so can we just go back for a moment? So 
another aircraft of some sort, airship, balloon, something was shot down today. Who owns it? What were the circumstances? Was the president directly involved in ordering this? Uh, and is wreckage being recovered? Well, or, there's Kate. So I'm going to try. Remind me if I forget something. Okay. Yes, the president absolutely was involved in this decision. He ordered it uh, at the recommendation of Pentagon leaders. Uh, he wanted it taken down, and they did that. They did it using fighter aircraft assigned to U.S. Northern Command. The Pentagon will have more to say about the details of this uh, later on this afternoon. It's only just within the last hour. Uh, we're calling this an object because that's the best description we have right now. Uh, we do not know who owns it, uh, whether it's a whether it's state owned or uh, or corporate owned or privately owned. We just don't know. Uh, we don't we don't know. As I said, state owned. We don't know if it's state owned, um, and we don't uh, understand the full purpose. We don't have any comp we don't have any information that would confirm a stated purpose for this object. Um, we do expect to be able to recover uh, the debris. Uh, since it fell not only within our territorial space, but on what we what we uh, believe is is frozen uh, water, so uh, it, uh, a recovery effort will be made, um, and uh, uh, we're hopeful that it'll be successful, and then we can learn a little bit more about it. Was its appearance like the Chinese aircraft? No, it was it, it was much much smaller than uh, the spy balloon that we took down last Saturday. Um, the way it was described to me was roughly the size of a small car, as opposed to a, a payload that was like two or three buses size, right? So much, much smaller, um, uh, and um, and there and not of the same, not not uh, no um, no significant payload, if you will. And lastly, lastly is, is it now the policy of the United States that if unidentified aircraft are over U.S. territory, that it is likely the president will choose to shoot it down? The president will always act in the best interest of our national security and in the safety and security of the American people. Thanks, Jackie. We're going to take you guys. John, so the Pentagon ordered this new object be taken down over Alaska. The president ordered it. The president ordered it. So is it a fair takeaway then that the Pentagon regrets not taking down the first balloon before it crossed the entire U.S.? Well, I'm not going to speak for the Pentagon. I can tell you that the president doesn't regret the, the way that we uh, handled the first balloon. Um, that time we, first of all, apples and oranges here in terms of size. As I said, this was the size of a small car and it was over uh, a very sparsely populated area, but also more critically over, it was over water water space when we ordered this down as we did the as uh, we did the last one but it, completely different size um and um the debris field f for this uh we expect to be but much much smaller than would have been for the other one that's difference one difference two uh, we knew for a fact that the PR prc balloon that we shot down last week was in fact a surveillance asset um, and capable of surveillance over sensitive military sites, and that it had self-propulsion and maneuver capabilities. There's no indication that this one did. The other one, the first one, was able to maneuver and loiter, slow down, speed up. Um, it was very, it was very purposeful that flight path within inside the inside the, the jet stream. That would suggest that maybe you should it out. Over Alaska too, though. Well, well, well I, look, the Pentagon's already spoken to this question about whether or not they uh, should have or could have shot it down over Alaska airspace. So I would refer you to there was two hours and hours of testimony yesterday on that. On, on the communications, though, we still don't know. And correct me if I'm wrong. We don't know what intelligence or communications um, could have been collected or what devices they were targeting, as I understand it. So that being said, how can the president say it was not a major breach if we don't know that? What we do know is uh, we knew the basic flight path of this thing, and we were able to take steps at sensitive military sites that we believed would be all along the flight path uh, to significantly curtail any intelligence ability that the Chinese could get uh, get from from the balloon. Certainly, curtail anything that would be above and beyond. Uh, you know what they normally try to collect through other means. Go 
red peak, and then we'll, we'll get around. Thanks, thanks John. Um, was this latest object that was, uh, that was shot down uh, within the last hour, was that detected based upon any information gleaned from the monitoring of the last balloon over the last uh, over last week, in terms of what you learned about that Chinese program that, that, that informed the decision to shoot this, this item down? I, I think I'd, I'd be careful saying that anything specific to to what we've learned from that last platform, and you know, we did be, we were able to collect some information from it while it was in flight. That was another reason why uh, uh, we let it tra traverse uh, over land the way it did. But I I, I would be uh, I, I, I would not say that information gleaned from our surveillance of that surveillance balloon provided insights that that permitted this detection and track. And as of this moment, are you convinced that you shot down, uh, uh, do you know what you shot down, that it wasn't just, you know, a harmless weather balloon, uh, that, you know, that, that, that there was some motivation flying this over U.S. airspace, or is it, is it truly <coughs> I think we're going to try to learn more. I can tell you it was an object, and it was at 40,000 feet, and the, the, uh, the predominant concern by the president was a safety of flight issue at that altitude. Remember the one that we shot down last Saturday, it was at, 65 plus thousand feet, um, so no threat to civilian aircraft. This one at 40,000 feet could have posed a, th a threat to civilian aircraft, and it did not appear to have uh, the maneuverable capability that the other one did. So, um, uh, you know, virtually at the uh, at the whim of the wind. Thank you, Crane. So just thank you, Pervy. So to follow up on what you just said about um, civilian aircraft, is that what you meant initially when you said there was a reasonable threat? Uh, to shoot it down. Yes. Was my exact yeah. words were reasonable uh, threat to the safety of civilian flight. Okay, and um, to given what you said earlier about intent with regard to the Chinese spy balloon, does the U.S. give any credence to the Chinese argument that the balloon accidentally veered off course and ended up where it did? The which one, you're talking about the one from last week. Yeah, is there, is it, say, say that again. Or is it? Does the U.S. give any credence to the Chinese argument that this thing accidentally veered off course and ended up where it did? No. So, was it targeting specific places? Was it targeting military uh, sites? What we know is that the flight path it executed took it over sensitive military sites. What we also know is that it could maneuver that it had propulsion capability and steerage capability um, and could slow down, speed up, um, and that it it was on a path to transit over sensitive military sites. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Admiral Kirby. On the latest object, you said it did not appear to have the maneuverability capabilities that the Chinese spy balloon have. Did it have any maneuverability, or was it flying on its own? At this time, all I, all I can tell you is it did not appear to have the ability to, uh, to independently maneuver. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll attempt recovery, and we'll see what we can learn more from. And then just, sorry, just one more on the Chinese spy balloon. Uh, we're reporting that the U.S. is about to impose export controls on Chinese companies that are believed to have been involved in that balloon surveillance program. Can you confirm that and say when the administration might impose those export controls. I'm not in a position to confirm those reports right now, um, and I'd refer you to the Department of Treasury. Thank you, Admiral. Um, I, I believe you said that this was shot down, or at least it landed in the waters or the frozen waters off the, the coast of Alaska, correct? That is our so, initial assessment. So is the policy still, considering the first one was shot down off the east coast and this high altitude object was shot down off the west coast, is the policy at this point in time you could shoot it down if it's over over a body of water. I wouldn't derive from these two incidents some sort of policy uh, that, that comes out of it. Uh, a, the, the president will always act in the best interest of the American people and in our national security. Um, last week, we were talking about a surveillance asset um, that was purposely flown over the continental United States. In the case today, we're talking about uh, an object. Again, we don't know a lot about it, but, uh, but that at its altitude represented a potential threat to the safety of flying customers, uh, you know, civil air traffic. Based on your broad and deep experience, who do you think 
might own or have flown this thing in the air. I have no idea. Good you don't know who owns it, who's flown it, but has anyone from the administration reached out to the Chinese to see whether they will claim this new object? I know of no outreach this afternoon to uh, the, the Chinese government about this. The State Department uh, over the weekend, or the last few days, I'm losing track of days, but since the first spy balloon, confirmed that they think that these Chinese spy balloons have gone over 40 countries. Considering that fact and this new development today, what's next on a larger diplomatic front? The U.S talking with allies about how to police this guy, about how to bring this to the UN to figure out what to do? We are, we are talking to um, uh, dozens of nations uh, who we know have, um, have been overflown by Chinese surveillance uh, balloons, uh, part of this program that the Chinese have invested in. Uh, to share with them the context and information that we've learned by the forensics we've done since we came in office about this particular program. And I would remind you that we, we briefed Congress in a classified setting back in August about this. This is not something we haven't been uh, trying to learn more about. Uh, we, we've been aware of it and trying to glean more information from it. And this, um, we expect that the, the recovery of the debris from the balloon we shut down on, on Saturday, last Saturday, will help us uh, gain even more information. Um, but we are in the active conversations with many of these countries who we know have been uh, overflown. Yeah, where specifically in Alaska was the high altitude object shot down? So I'm going to, the Pentagon will be talking more about this a little bit later. They'll probably have uh, more detail uh, for you. But um, the general area would be just off the very, very northeastern part of Alaska, right near the Alaska-Canada border. Near the Arctic Ocean? There, well, yeah. In fact, that's where it went down on that, on that, on that northern side of Alaska, near the Canadian border, uh, on water that is frozen in the, uh, yes, in the Arctic Ocean. Never over land? It no, it was. It, it was. Okay. Yeah. And it was shot down within the last hour. When did you said? When, when did the first? When did the U.S. first uh, get intelligence that it existed? Uh, the knowledge about the uh, the balloon uh, in the track uh, first came to our attention uh, last evening. Okay. What time thereabouts? I, I don't have an exact time on the clock for you. It was last right. evening. Well, it, it's, have you ruled out, I mean, or not ruled out, but you have not determined that it was surveillance in nature, correct? You we haven't ruled anything in or out. Um, we, we, and that, uh, that's why we're calling this thing an object. Um, and you just called it a balloon. You, you misspoke there. I'm sorry. Sorry. It's not a yes. I'm sorry. You, you guys have. You can't say it's a balloon either. You guys have me with balloon yeah. on the brain right now. Right. <laughs> this was this was an object. Let me just clarify, I'm not classifying it as a balloon right now. It's an object. We're still trying to learn more from it. That it landed on, on, what, on water that is frozen could help us assist, make it easier for us to, to try to recover some of the debris. Uh, the U.S. Northern Command is examining what the possibilities for that and are. Finally, you said you have no knowledge of any outreach to the Chinese yet uh, from, from the administration. <laughs> are there plans to reach out and ask whether they I know of no plans to reach out to the Chinese specifically on this. I want to stress again, we don't know what entity owns this object. There's no indication that it's from uh, a nation or an institution or an individual. We just don't know. Foreign entity, right? We don't know who owns this object. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are you tracking any other similar objects right now at this time? I'm not aware of any other and, tracks. And then also, I, I know that you said that this was due to a civilian aircraft threat, um, but why not wait till it's over warmer water where you could ease more easily recover? Uh, well, it wasn't heading over warmer water. It was heading over the Arctic. It's not very warm. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Admiral. Um, one question on today's incident and then one on a separate subject, if I may. Uh, given how little was known about this object at the time that our forces shot it down, is it safe to say that when the president ordered that it be shot down, he did not know whether it was a manned or unmanned object? We were able to uh, get some fighter aircraft up and around it uh, before uh, the order to shoot it down, and the pilot's assessment was that this was not manned. Okay. 
on a different subject. After the State of the Union address, minutes after he finished delivering the State of the Union address, President Biden encountered uh, in the halls of the Capitol Brittany Alconis, the wife of your Navy comrade Ridge Alconis, who, as you know, remains imprisoned in Japan. And the President told Mrs. Alconis, we're going to get this done. I wonder if you can tell us if the Alconis case figured in the conversation that the President had with the Japanese Prime Minister when he visited here last month, and if you can flesh out the President's promise to Mrs. Alconis. I know generally you don't like to say a whole lot about these kinds of uh, efforts, but what can you tell us about what's being done on behalf of Lieutenant Alconis? I, I would uh, go back to what I said to you last time, James. I mean, the President's well aware of this case. Um, and he's well aware of what the family's uh, going through. He's also well aware of concerns by the Japanese government with respect to their judicial system. Um, and, um, and he's got the team working on this. I'm not going to disclose personal conversations that the President had either with Mrs. Alconis or with uh, Prime Minister Kishida. But he's well aware of it, he's tracking it, and so is the national security team. Thank you, Kareem. Uh, Admiral, over here. Um, I wanted to ask you um, two, two questions. Two I need to watch for her hands. One on, one on the shootdown that you just described and the other one on Ukraine. On, on the incident that happened in the past hour, I wanted to know, is there any line of communication that you can describe that has been ongoing over the course of the past two weeks on the diplomatic side of things? I know that the defense secretary says that his, con his a call to his counterpart was not returned from China. But on the diplomatic side of things, are there lines of communication between the U.S. and China right now? Well, certainly, look, we have, a, we have a, an embassy in Beijing. Diplomatic uh, uh, discussions routinely happen with, with Beijing. So, of course, the diplomatic channels remain open. Sadly, uh, the military ones uh, uh, do not appear to be open right now. Secretary Austin made a good faith effort to reach out to his counterpart and, um, and, uh, and was rebuffed. And, and that's unfortunate, particularly when uh, at, times, at times like this, you want to keep as, uh, as open as you can the lines of communication. And the president's committed to that. And then on Ukraine, uh, President Zelensky was in the UK earlier this week, and he received a promise from the UK government that the UK would train Ukrainian pilots on uh, NATO standard uh, jet fighters. Uh, can you tell me if you think that's a good idea? Is that something that the U.S. is considering in terms of training Ukrainian pilots on NATO aircraft as well? Well, if they're going to get Western aircraft, uh, then they're going to need to be trained on them. Does that mean that will happen? They'll get Western aircraft? Uh, I, that would be up to the nations that, uh, that may be willing to provide aircraft. Um, I, I'll, I've said it before, probably tired of me hearing, about it, hearing me say it, but uh, these are all sovereign decisions. And uh, if, a, if a NATO nation, or even a non-NATO nation, wants to provide capabilities like fighter aircraft to Ukraine, that's certainly their decision to make. Uh, and one would assume uh, that if you're going to introduce a system into a, def into a military that they have no experience with, that there's going to have to be some training that goes along with that. We're doing it right now, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. We've got Ukrainian soldiers uh, learning how to use a, a Patriot battery. Um, and um, outside of Ukraine, we're, we're helping train them on uh, combined arms maneuver. So it's not unusual to do that if an advanced capability is provided, but that's going to be a national decision. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Admiral. Um, thank you, Corinne. Isn't there a concern that these objects, that the object and the balloon, were both discovered when they're already flying over U.S. airspace? Should they be detected before they enter the U.S.? I think we're going to continue to learn a lot about um, how uh, how these things are uh, or can be detected in a better way. You heard the NORTHCOM commander talk about um, certain gaps that he felt he had in his domain awareness. So. From this incident last week, we will learn, we'll certainly learn about the capabilities of that surveillance asset, but we're, we're also, we also expect to learn more about our own processes and our own systems for detection and tracking. Um, uh, I, I, I don't want to get into exactly how this one was detected, but um, uh, I can assure you that, uh, that we're going to continue to try to improve our own knowledge base with respect to these systems. Um, can you say anything about the proximity of it and its flight path to the sensitive oil fields near Prudhoe Bay? And was there any threat 
at all at any point to, to that equipment in that region of Alaska. I'm referring to the Pentagon for more detail about the track. Again, this just all happened within the last hour, so I don't know what the proximity was to, to, to oil fields. And your second question was? Oh, it's just about the sensitivity, you know, the oil fields, basically. Well, again, I mean, we just don't know what this object was. We don't, uh, it would be difficult for me to point to a threat or a, a specific concern such as oil fields when we don't really understand what this object uh, was doing. Okay. And then I just have one more quick question on the Russian, completely different topic. Uh, the Russians have said they're going to cut oil off output now. Um, what is the U.S. response to that? And will you reach out to OPEC to ask them to sort of compensate the difference so that the price of oil doesn't escalate at a time when you're just starting to see inflation? Or Once inflation? again, Mr. Putin's willing to weaponize energy. Um, and uh, the, this, uh, uh, this move, if it proves to be true, uh, it doesn't come as a big surprise uh, as a reaction to the, to the price gap. Um, and it just shows you the lengths to which he's willing to, to, to use resources like energy as a, again, as a weapon. What the United States will do, have done, continue to do, is work with allies and partners to make sure we can better balance supply and demand uh, uh, and, and try to meet that need. It's important. We still believe that Mr. Putin not be allowed to profiteer uh, in an inappropriate way off of the oil he puts on the market so that he can then fund his, his military in the field. I don't have any diplomatic outreach to speak to today. We're going to continue to talk to allies and partners. Certainly OPEC falls in that category, but I don't have any specific conversations to talk Jenny, about. Okay. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you, John. I have two questions. Uh, China is claiming uh, ownership of the balloon, and the China said that uh, they will take legal action. Will you send the balloon back to the China? There are no plans to send the debris that we are recovering back to China. We're going to pull it up off the bottom of the wa off the o ocean, um, and we're going to learn more about this capability. Uh, Iran is uh, building a drone factory in Russia, and North Korea is receiving military drone from Russia. How do you view armed co co cooperation between North Korea, Iran, and Russia? Now, I can't confirm those specific reports, Jenny, but um, I was up here not long ago talking about the the burgeoning defense relationship between Iran and Russia, which is not only not good for the people of Ukraine, it's not good for the people of the Middle East, because it'll flow both ways, and Russian capabilities could very well end up in Iranian hands. Um, and I would say the same about uh, North Korea. We know, I got up here and showed you pictures, we know that, uh, that they're providing uh, ammunition to Russia, artillery ammunition uh, specifically. Um, and again, that's not only not good for uh, the people of Ukraine, it's not good for, for the, the Korean Peninsula and the region there, that, that, that Russia and North Korea uh, could be, again, developing uh, a, a deeper defense relationship. Thanks, John. Just a few more on the end. Um, you said it was discovered last night. Was it flying consistently at an altitude of roughly 40,000 feet that entire time? Roughly, yes. Uh, were there any, given that, were there any sightings that you're aware of by airmen? Civilian no, aircraft sir. operators now. No, uh, and can you just to nail it down? Can you tell us when the president gave the order to shoot? It? Gave the order to shoot it down this morning. Yeah. Again, just keep following up on the same topic. Um, the speed with which you guys, with, with which the president apparently decided to shoot it down, having just discovered the first intelligence of it last night, and by the morning he's saying shoot it down. Um, was there something specific, more specific about the threat than just generally being in the airspace in, at which, the, the, the height at which? The, the predominant height. reason, the predominant reason driving the president's decision was the safety of flight issue. No, I understand it was, a, but, but there had, I mean, that's a really big area up there. It's not all that many planes. It's not like it was in the middle of the Northeast Corridor or something. Is there no way but, in which but, that but, could have, you guys could have said, hey, air, you know, airplanes, like, steer clear of this area until we know better what this thing is, because we're, you know, I mean, in other words, was there some reason the why? The president wasn't willing to take that kind of a risk in, in time, that because it, because uh, um, this thing did not appear to be self-maneuvering, and therefore at the mercy of prevailing winds, it was, it was much less predictable, um, and, um, 
And so I, the president just wasn't willing to, to take that risk. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that there were fighter aircraft who were able to determine that uh, it likely was not manned. Were those fighter aircraft able to determine anything else about it from up close that uh, they wouldn't be able to find out otherwise? They worked really hard to try to get as much information as they could about this object. Uh, given its size, um, uh, which was much smaller, um, and, um, and the capabilities on the fighter aircraft themselves, the speed at which they were flying, it was difficult for the pilots to, to glean a whole lot of information, not like we were able to glean off the other, the, the balloon, not the other balloon, the balloon, thank you, Michael. Um, because we, and we also had, you know, uh, several days to track that. So uh, there, there was a limit to how much they could uh, divine. Also, um, it was detected at night, and so the first engagement uh, by fighter aircraft uh, late last night was again difficult for them you know it just it's just it was a small object and these are fighter aircraft flying at pretty pretty high speed and um, and the ability to get a lot of to glean a lot of information was limited which is why we they did another uh, flight uh, earlier this morning to see if we could get more I mean they did the best they could but again the speed and um, and the uh, the conditions up there as well as the the size of the of the object made, made it a little bit more difficult confirm there were two there were there was a flight last night to do some a, surveillance. Yes. that's 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 right and there was at least two that I know of again the Pentagon will probably have more detail but at least two there was a last night a couple of fighter aircraft uh, surveilled it tried to glean as much information as we could about what it was so we had a sense um, and then uh, another such flight uh, today, and of course that flight ended up, you know, in, in a shoot down. Sorry, just one, one more question. Um, <laughs> We're running out of from, time. From, from the White House podium, do you have a message for whoever uh, is responsible for this aircraft or anyone who may have similar aircraft about uh, what the White House is uh, I, 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 Rather than sending some sort of message in that way, I, I would just tell you that we're going to remain vigilant about uh, our airspace. We're going to remain vigilant about the skies over the United States. And as I said earlier, um, the, the president takes his obligations to protect our national security interest and those of, and the safety and security of the American people uh, is paramount. And he's always going to make, he's always going to decide and act in a way that is commensurate with that duty. Um, that's, that's the real takeaway here. Okay, way in the back. Did the U.S. ask Brazil to block Iranian warships from docking in Rio, and if so, why? We did not ask the uh, Brazilians to to, uh, to to block that. Uh, those ships are uh, sanctioned ships, specifically, and we don't want to see them dock anywhere in this hemisphere. And we've been very clear about that. But there was no specific ask made of Brazil. That's a sovereign decision that President Lula has to make. Um, I wanted to follow up on a question I asked you in September. In light of the Chinese spy balloon incident, does this administration consider Chinese land purchases near U.S. military bases a national security threat? We uh, uh, are always concerned about potential foreign collection near or around uh, our military sites. And you're right, last week is a good example of that. Um, we take uh, that seriously, whether that's terrestrial related uh, or whether it's uh, uh, from uh, from the air. And I think I'll just leave it at that. Would you be working perhaps with Congress to put in place legislation to prevent that kind we of? We are always willing to work with Congress uh, to to address our national security interests and our and, and threats uh, as best we can. Thanks, Karine. Uh, thanks, Admiral. So, uh, thank, all right. thank you, Karine. Uh, Admiral, just real quick, is there a timeline for recovery of this object? You'd have to talk to the Pentagon. I don't know. Again, guys, this just happened within the last now hour and a half, and uh, and they're still assessing uh, where this thing landed and and the degree to which they can get to it. And on the Poland visit, uh, I know in the statement that you put out, Karine, it says that the president is going to meet uh, with leaders of the eastern flank NATO countries. Are any other European leaders, NATO leaders, expected to join the president? on this trip. We're still putting the agenda together. The pr predominant reason to meet with them, the Bucharest 9, as you call it, is, is to really talk to those nations who are literally on the, 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 the eastern flank of, of the NATO alliance. But I can't rule in or rule out that there may be additional attendees or additional meetings that the president might have. Thank you very much. Um, hello, Tom. Over here. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs>
back to Lula, if you can remember him. Um, is there, is, is there, is there going to be any commitment to the Amazon fund by the United States uh, during this visit? Uh, I think uh, let's let's have the visit occur here uh, shortly, and uh, we'll be provide you a readout. I don't have anything specific on that. Thank you. Uh, so, John, uh, the U.S. Special Presidential Coordinator for Global and Infrastructure Energy is in Angola. So he met with President Lorenzo. Can you elaborate a little more on this visit? I don't have any information on that. We'll take the question and see if we can get you a better answer. Uh, just a quick one on the timeline. Was the president briefed on the object last night when the track first came to the administration's yes, attention? He was. He was as soon as as soon as the Pentagon had enough information to provide him, they did that. Last question. Ukraine. Uh, thank you, madam. Thank you, John. Uh, as far as Russia's war against Ukraine is concerned, one year now, the president believes that when Prime Minister Modi of India told President Putin to stop the war, and this is not the way that uh, this time that war should go like this. And you think uh, there is still time for Prime Minister Modi to stop the war or convince President Putin? I think there's still time for Mr. Putin to stop the war. I think there's still time for Mr. Putin to stop the war. Prime Minister can convince? I'll let, Ms. I'll let the Prime Minister speak to whatever efforts he's willing to undertake. Um, I, I want to stress it again, Goyle. I mean, certainly the United States would welcome any effort that could lead to uh, uh, an end of hostilities in Ukraine that are in keeping with President Zelensky's objectives and his leadership, his determination of what is acceptable to the Ukrainian people. Nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. So uh, President Biden has said this, gosh, dozens of times. We, we think this war could end today, it should end today. The, 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 the single person responsible for what the Ukrainian people are going through is Vladimir Putin, and he could stop it right now. Instead, he's firing cruise missiles uh, into energy and power uh, infrastructure and trying to knock out the lights and knock out the heat so the Ukrainian people suffer even more than they already have. He could end it right now. Um, and since he's not willing to do that, clearly, uh, we've got to make sure we can help the Ukrainians succeed on the battlefield so that when President Zelensky determines it's time to negotiate, and he's the only one that can make that determination, he can do it with the strongest hand possible. And finally, sir, 1.4 billion people in India are waiting for President Biden to welcome. Uh, when is the next trip? I don't have any travel. Other than the travel that Kareem talked to today, I don't have any travel to announce. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have Thanks, a good Admiral. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Admiral. Okay, now for the boring part of the briefing. Um, we just have a few minutes, guys, so we don't have a lot of time. So let me just go th over the week ahead. Uh, so later today, as you all know, the president will hold a bilateral meeting with President Lula of Brazil. Tomorrow, the president and the first lady will welcome governors and their spouses for a black tie dinner at the White House. The vice president and the second, second gentleman will attend. On Tuesday, the president will deliver a keynote address during the National Association of Counties at the, Was at the Washington Hilton Hotel, and we'll certainly have more to share on the week ahead in, 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 a, in a day or two. Uh, and finally, there is a uh, bittersweet day for us, a bittersweet moment uh, for the communications and press teams and all of us here at the White House. Uh, I've gotten to know Kate Bedingfield as a colleague and a friend, being in the trenches together and representing the president's agenda together. Uh, I've actually known Kate since 2007. That's a whole other story. Um, but Kate has been fighting this fight on behalf of the president since long before the campaign was launched, going back to when she was his communications director as vice president. She's been a trusted source of tr strategic advice and an unflinching voice for the president's message and values, playing an integral role in our successes these first two years and on the campaign. She's also a pillar of this team, which she helped build as the deputy campaign manager across the primary and general elections. I understand that after a certain previous occupant of this White House, whose name will be nameless, but as you know who this person is, uh, he got angry and yelled and said, quote, Biden has a team of killers. All I've got, all I've got is a defense. Okay, that was in the campaign. That was the campaign communications team started calling Kate and the captain, the captain of the team killers. That doesn't surprise me at all because if there's one thing Kate is, she is a leader. 
We're very sad to see her go, but no one has earned some time with their children, spouse, and dog more than Kate. And I look forward to welcoming Ben LeBolt. As you all know, he has been announced to replace uh, Kate as communications director back to the White House. Ben has had a uh, top role, communications role, uh, on the last three successful Supreme Court nominations by uh, Democratic presidents. We all got to work with him closely when he was the head of communications for the confirmation of, ju of now Justice Jackson. And we're glad that he is coming back to be a more permanent uh, part of the team. I've known Ben for many years, including both Obama-Biden campaigns and the Obama-Biden White House, where he worked on climate change and civil rights. Uh, I was happy to reconnect with him when he took over communications for nominations during the transition, helping advance the case for the most diverse cabinet in history and for a host of groundbreaking uh, sub-cabinet positions as well. He brings a cutting-edge understanding of modern communications to the table, and I know he'll fight hard for the president's agenda uh, in the upcoming year, uh, months, and years. I also knew, uh, I also know uh, that Ben is making history. As you know, we believe here in the Biden-Harris White House that representation matters. He will be the first openly uh, gay uh, um, uh, communications director, which is very, very important indeed. Okay, with that, Zeke. Uh, um, could you just, uh, the list on the president's trip to Poland didn't say where he would be going in Poland. Can you let us know cities? We will have more to share as we get uh, as we get closer to the day. We just wanted to make sure that you all had the information that he will be traveling uh, during the dates that I laid out, um, the February 20, 20th to the 22nd, and we'll certainly have more to share. Briefly on a different topic, last night uh, I was reporting that former Vice President was subpoenaed by the Special Counsel Jack Smith as a result of some of the investigations of the previous administration. Um, that obviously raises a bunch of privilege concerns. Would the President waive executive privilege uh, for the former Vice President's testimony? Uh, for a grand jury, or it, 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 it's I, I, I'm just not going to, as you can imagine, I'm not going to speak to this. I'm just going to refer you to the Department of Justice. Oh, nobody has a question. I can leave right now. <laughs> Karine, um, thank you. A uh, new Inspector General report accuses the architect of the Capitol, Brett Blanton, of a bunch of things widespread misuse of taxpayer funded government vehicles, misleading information to investigators. Um, impersonating law enforcement. That's in addition to making the decision not to go to the Capitol on January 6, 2021, <clears throat> which outraged Democrats and Republicans. And the president is the only person who has the authority to fire him. Is that something he's considering? So uh, obviously we're taking this very seriously and uh, we're seeing the report reports as well, as you know, um, and we take uh, any advice that the members of Congress or any uh, action that they want to, to take very seriously as well. I just don't have anything for you at this time uh, to speak to on that particular matter. Okay, Justin. The House passed on a bipartisan basis uh, overturning uh, DC's new criminal code and also a law that would allow non-citizens to vote. Uh, is that something that the president would sign into law, or would he veto it? So I would have to go back to the team uh, and just get a, an answer for you on that. I just don't, I don't know that particular uh, piece of legislation. This is the first time I'm hearing about it. So once I get back to the team, we'll have an answer for you. Okay, Steve. Hey, Karine, while this briefing's been underway, the National Archives has released some of the communications between the president's personal attorneys and the agency. One of them, uh, dated on November 8th, has a <coughs> communication between Gary Stern, who was the general counsel of NARA, and Bob Bauer, the president's attorney, in which it references boxes in a Boston office. It says, Pat, this is to Pat Moore, who's the president's personal lawyer. Pat, we would like to pick up the boxes that are in your Boston office and move them to the JFK library. Any explanation as to what boxes we're doing in a Boston office and how this relates to Well, that? as you just mentioned, it's it just broke or the report just came out while we were in the middle of a briefing, so I can't speak to it from here because I just don't know what you're you're speaking to, uh, but I would refer you to the White House Counsel's Office to get more uh, uh, specifics or get you an answer there. Is, is it, is it uh, new to you, the idea that the boxes I, I'm, would be... I am I am learning about this as you are, uh, as you are asking the question, so I'm certainly not going to speak to it from here. Okay, Andrea. On the president's meeting today with the governors, um, he said during this meeting that Republicans are trying to uh, close off the possibility of cutting defense spending and that that leaves only a very few options. Um, you know, what is the president's view on how to get to the two trillion dollars in cuts that he has outlined in the State of the Union address? 
what is the best way to get there and does he rule out the possibility of cutting for instance defense spending so first and foremost is so folks know uh, march ninth the president's going to be putting out his budget uh, we have asked uh, the house uh, in congress the republican house to put out their budget as well uh, a, a more robust right a budget so we know exactly what it is that they are putting forth, the, the cuts that they want to put forth, and, and so that we can see, not just us, but the American people can see. Uh, as you just mentioned, the President meant, uh, said in his State of the Union address that he was going to uh, uh, cut the deficit by $2 trillion over a decade. I'm not going to get ahead of what the President's going to actually, the details or the specifics in his budget. Certainly once we put that out on March 9th, you'll, have, you'll be able to peruse and see exactly what the President is laying out. I'm just not going to, to get ahead of that. But I also want to add, and I've said this many times before, you've heard the President say this as well, uh, this is a President, the first two years he was able to cut uh, the deficit by $1.7 trillion. He takes his fiscal responsibility uh, very seriously. And uh, he is going to continue to find ways to build an economy uh, that doesn't leave anybody behind, but also is fiscally responsible, as I just mentioned. Go ahead. He also oh. said that he was, did not believe that Republicans would ultimately make good their threat um, on the, uh, to hold the debt uh, dealing extension or expansion hostage. What leads him to believe that? I mean, has he had subsequent conversations with other Republicans um, since his meeting with McCarthy? And when, when will he meet again with so I don't have any conversations or meetings to preview for you at this time. As you know, the the, uh, the meeting that he had with Speaker McCarthy not too long ago uh, was respectful. Uh, it was uh, productive. Uh, you you saw us put a readout, and you heard from uh, the Speaker himself when he was out at the sticks and after the meeting. Uh, look, it's pretty simple and it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we believe that Congress has a constitutional duty to get this done, to lift the debt ceiling. We've been saying that, and they should do it without conditions. That hasn't change. They did it three times with the last president. You've heard me say the number 78 many times in this briefing room. That's how many times that they have been able to get this done since 1960. That doesn't change. It should be done in a bipartisan way. Uh, and the president, uh, it will continue to call for that. And that's what they've done it before. And that's what he believes they should be doing it again. More optimistic today, and I'm wondering why. Oh, this is a president who's always optimistic. He, this is a president who believes in optimism. Uh, as you know, he says it many times when he speaks in front of the American people, uh, and so that is not surprising. You've heard me say that about him in describing uh, even his speech in for the State of the Union that you would hear some optimism. So of course he's going to be optimistic about it. Good. Um, particularly given Lula's visit here this afternoon, is there any kind of update on the possibility of expelling Bolsonaro from the U.S. Does the president personally believe that he should be allowed to remain here? As I've said before, we've never, uh, we had not received uh, any uh, any type of request uh, in that uh, in that vein. Uh, I'm not going to get ahead of a meeting that's going to happen very very shortly. You guys are all have to have to leave to. Uh, uh, for the pool spray that's going to happen in the Oval Office, so I'm not going to get ahead. Uh, the pre President Lula is going to go to the sticks um, right after the bilat, I believe, and take take many questions from many of you. So I'm certainly not going to get ahead of what's going to come up in that meeting or what what the uh, agenda might be. I think uh, the Admiral did a good job laying out our expectations, uh, but I will let uh, President Lula speak to that. His meeting, okay. His meeting with the governors uh, today. Do you know whether or how much the issue of COVID and the expiration of the public health emergency order, how much that came up, whether the governors feel confident that the states are ready for that to happen? So I can't speak to that. I haven't downloaded with what came up in that meeting. But what I can say is the president looked forward, very much looked forward to talking to the governors. He's going to continue the conversation and continue to see them b between today and tomorrow. Uh, and they've been great partners with us, uh, with all of the, uh, the, uh, the different historical pieces of legislation that we have been able to get done, and also that they're seeing the effects of in their own state. Okay, I'll see you guys on Monday. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.